welcome to the Found in Translation talk show, the talk show that stacks truth about politics and today's hottest headlines. This is your host, Ray Cuyasso. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for listening on the radio at WPPM LP 106.5 in the beautiful city of Philadelphia. Hashtag People Power Media. And as part of our podcast family, anywhere you can download a podcast. You can always keep the conversation going. We're, you know, we're not on the podcast. We're talking 24-7, engaging our social media and our larger Found in Translation community at Ray's Podcast, R-A-Y-S Podcast on Twitter, Ray's Latino Talk on IG, and email us, you know, as many of you have over the last few weeks and continue those conversations and and uh, discussions on, on the issues impacting our community and our world. You can email us your thoughts at podcastrays at gmail.com. That's podcastrays at gmail.com. In a moment, you will hear part two of our live show from the Polvida Cafe in beautiful, gorgeous, increíble San Diego, California, with Margot Porras and a cast of great guests. You'll hear part two of that special event we had uh, in a moment. But first, we have a few dedications we must acknowledge and honor. First, the show is first dedicated to the Earth's lungs, the Amazon rainforest, my friends. If you haven't seen in the news, tens of thousands of fires have been scorching Brazil's Amazon rainforest, proliferating the fastest at the fastest rate, according to the country's National Institute of Space Research. They've actually been chronicling this by satellites and planes and images from the from space. Uh, in the images, in the imagery, and you can really see the impact of the fires literally pilfering, pilfering throughout the entire country, but particularly the Amazon. Brazil has had an 80% increase in these fires from the same time last year. 36 new fires in a month, 9,500 fires in the last week. This is not normal, my folks. Environmental organizations and activists in the country, as best they can tell, believe that people are creating these fires as many as 99% of them, and that's according to the senior scientists at their uh, institute, um, their Institute of Space Research that recently got fired by the president over that assertion. Now, people would wonder why. Why would we want to bother? I mean, one of the wonders of the world and really one of the trademarks of the beautiful country of Brazil. Well, you don't have to go too far because uh, sort of the worst-case scenario copycat version uh, of of our president, Donald Trump, uh, far right wing, ultra right wing, rel- relatively newly elected, I believe last year, Brazilian president, Jair Bolsonaro, ultra pro business, ultra anti environmental protections, told us while he was running for president, he was wanted to do this massive deforestation and um, uh, drilling and, and development and deforestation uh, and elimination and erosion of Amer- uh, the world's lungs, the Amazon rainforest. So it's pretty clear to me the culprits of this assault are somewhere connected uh, to this terror that we have as Brazilian's president. This is really an assault on the on mother of 20% of our oxygen comes from the Amazon. This is clearly an incredible attack of, of just that has global health and environmental uh, 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 consequences to all of us, particularly people that live in Latin America. You know, he is such a Bolsonaro is really kind of the worst case scenario, right? He, he got his main political rival in prison to secure his victory free Lula. And honestly, his primary appeal was very much playing to the lowest common denominator of a Brazilian, of the Brazilian community must misogyny. And uh, this call on to further restrict the rights of Brazilian women and frankly, scaring many Brazilians into thinking that the main problem with Brazil was street violence perpetrated by Afro and indigenous Brazilians. Look up Marissa Franco, the martyr of this era of Brazilian civil rights. It'll give you some texture as to the scope of the of the attacks on our civil rights, particularly amongst the Afro Brazilian and indigenous Brazilian communities. You know, folks, this is really ugly stuff. You know, going back to our our, our indigenous population that that not only has cared for the lands of the and the rivers and the and the and the foliage of the Amazon rainforest for thousands of years, right? Um, 
not only are their lands, their homeland, their houses, their communities being attacked, our 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 lands, our most sacred lands in this hemisphere are being attacked, but these communities are being attacked. Many of which have remained very uh, uh, culturally connected, uh, unified, and speak their own native languages, their own indigenous cultures in in the deep uh, forests and jungles of the Amazon. They don't want to bother anybody. They just want to preserve the beautiful communities that they've maintained for thousands of years. Let's do all that we can to protect and save the Earth's lungs from this sad chapter of greed and discrimination. This episode is also dedicated to Albert Haquez. And you probably don't know that name unless you're in the D.C. Beltway or have met Albert over the years. But let me let me tell you a little bit about Albert. I want to read. This is a press release that was released by the President CEO of Unidos U.S., the nation's largest Latino civil rights organization in the country, hours ago. Quote, with great sorrow, Unidos U.S. is mourning the loss of our senior director of legislative and political affairs, Albert Jaquez, who passed away suddenly over the weekend. This is a commentary from the President CEO of Unidos U.S., Janet Murguia. Albert had, had a long and illustrious career and spent his life serving our community. And our relationship with him dates back decades. It's impossible to sum up his many accomplishments, but let's try to at least share some thoughts. And I want to share with you, first of all, Albert was one of the first Latinos ever to serve as a chief of staff for a member, a sitting member of Congress that was former Congressman Esteban Torres of California. For my, my Californians listening to the show, a legendary political figure, not only from a Latino perspective, but a uh, one of the nation's uh, pioneering Latino labor leaders, Esteban, uh, uh, is, is a legend in California politics, Latino history. Albert was his right hand man for for many years in different roles, working in Congress, working for presidents. Albert had his hand on many of the policy victories that serve us to this day. He helped steer the passage of the IRCA Act of 1986. That's the act, of course, that gave 3 million immigrants a pathway to citizenship, including dozens of my friends when they were small kids and babies, thinking about Irma Rivera, thinking about Ruben Kiwin, thinking about, I mean, just Leo Prieto, multitudes of my personal dear friends um, uh, were given the opportunity to become citizens and uh, the path to be incredible contributors to our country. Um, And there's probably hundreds of people right now that benefited uh, from the IRCA Act. Albert was a big part of that behind the scenes in Washington during that time. The North American Development Bank, which became an incredible vehicle to develop the economic growth of South Texas and other border communities. The Home Buyer Counseling Program at HUD. If you're a first-time home buyer, working class background, there's a good chance, particularly if you're a person of color, that that Home Buyer Counseling Program in some way supported you. Albert, again, working behind the scenes, uh, working, um, uh, you know, helping the mechanics of Washington when Washington worked to, on some level in the 80s and 90s, making it happen with very little fanfare. You know, from a historic perspective, Albert Jaquez is probably one of the most underrated Latino leaders of his generation. I kind of equate him to the Edwin Encarnacion of Latino public servants. Um his footprint in all of these policies and movements was like really impactful. Like, you know, I mean, without these investments and not these policies, we don't have much of the economic uh, growth that we've had in communities like Brownsville, Texas and McAllen and Douglas, Arizona and those places. And a lot of us don't have our houses. I mean, you can't, and many of us wouldn't literally have been here and, and at least created a, a framework of what potentially comprehensive immigration reform in this era which has even higher stakes, would entail. And, you know, from like a mentorship perspective and a sort of a Washington, D.C. perspective, Albert, again, an incredible pioneer for Latinos working in the Beltway, whether it's in the halls of Congress, working for a federal agency, working as a lobbyist, just being a Latino in Washington. I was trying to make a difference in the world as a public servant. You know, Albert touched your life in the last 20, 30 years. There's no question about that. If you got a cousin that's in that world, going to grad school, works for a member of Congress, any anybody in that scene, Albert probably has helped them along the way. 
This is also a very personal dedication for me. Albert was my boss at Unidos. Um, I literally spoke to Albert uh, probably within 24 hours of him passing just in the normal course of doing business. Uh, So this is just incredibly sad on a personal level. You know, Albert was all you could ask for in a supervisor. You know, he, he relished in mentorship. You know, Albert really didn't have to do this job. He was, he had a, he had a retirement set um, and really did the work because he wanted to support our community. And really, most of all, uh, even though he was still a pretty young man, only in his 60s, um, you know, he really relished men- mentoring the next generation of of activists and, and Latinos in, in our movement. Passionate about sharing his knowledge. God, the guy knew so much. Yeah, he, he knew his stuff, man. And he held everyone, including me, at times when I had to be held, accountable to the highest standards our community deserves. You know, we had a lot of simpatico with that brother. You know, he's he sort of lived the life I'm trying to live and strive to. Proud husband, proud father, man. That guy was proud of his de- his sons, and right deservedly so. Two amazing young guys. Baseball nut. I mean, I, I mean, one of the great Washington National fans you ever want to meet. I mean, just always wanted, was obsessed with the NL East. And you know what? After this incredible career where he could have uh, went off to the sunset, played golf every day, he's still at this age and at this stage in his life, still wanted to change the world. And that bond will always remain with us. Albert, going to miss your brother. This is so sad. So sad. You had so much more to give. But rest assured, me and Mano, the Jaquez clan, the Unidos family, and the Fountain Translation community will continue to honor your legacy. This is really sad. Really, really sad. This wasn't the time, but sometimes we just don't know why. You can go to unidosus.org to learn more about Albert Jaquez and how you can honor his legacy. We're now going to listen to part two of my live show in San Diego from a few weeks ago. In this segment, you'll hear from our co-host, Margo Borras of the Books versus Movies podcast and the book her, as an author herself, La Colonia, James Garcia of Vanguardia, Arizona, Naomi Shelton of KIPP, and my Cuban brother, Nisam Leon, discuss many topics, including Nisam leading our discussion about why the city of Los Angeles loves to steal San Diego sports teams. Shout out to my homie Nisam for his new podcast. I'm so excited for him. La Boca de Leon, which you can now hear on iTunes and anywhere you can download a podcast. It is incredibly awesome. We're actually going to be airing some of the initial episodes on our Latino Sports Talk feed. So definitely check out La Boca de Leon. Let's hear from our San Diego crew. And I'll come back later in the show with a few thoughts about the Jay-Z Colin Kaepernick situation. Uh, Again, Margo, remind people uh, where we're at here and remind people where they can catch your podcast. We are here in Barrio Logan, a uh, historic Barrio Logan, Logan Heights in San Diego. And uh, you can catch my podcast. Everywhere you listen to podcasts, it's book versus movie. And, uh, and the other one is Libros Libres, which is the other the, uh, the one that I do about, about books. And they're both everywhere. They're okay. Both and we're going to, uh, Familia, let's introduce and bring to the stage James Garcia. He's our next guest that's going to come up. So James Garcia, oh, journalist, yeah. activist, uh, uh, another Phoenix guy. That's what happens in August. Phoenix empties because everybody goes to San Diego. Yes, everybody's so, here. Very, uh, <laughs> very, you're right about that, James. So let, let's talk about the media stuff. You know, we started talking about this with podcasting, but yeah. no, no, James, you're you're about to start. You've tipped your dough in, into that space as well. But why is it so important that we continue to develop our own media channels here? Well, you know, I was actually thinking about this uh, today, the, this morning. I was thinking, you know, podcast. It's like the printing press when it arrived on civilization, right? And it's, it was this affordable thing that anyone could sort of do. And, and at some point here in the United States, cities had 20 newspapers, you know, and, and yeah. because everyone could do it. And eventually things, you know, sort of winnowed out, if you will, and got corporatized and all of that. But I think we're in, we're in this place where people just, you know, they have, they have messages that they want to deliver. They're distinct. They have some skills. They basically say, you know what? Here's a media. It's handy, and I'll just try my hand at it. And of course, uh, some people do incredibly fantastic work and explode. And um, it's just you know, it's it's there and it's available for us. Yeah, and I think what's also happening is that it's um, it's really creating these online communities. First of all, even beyond the diversity piece, 
that that are just looking for substantive content because that's hard to find in like on the boob tube. Yeah. Um, and then you know when you get into niches and issues of diversity, this. I mean, look when I started six years ago, I didn't know any. I didn't know anyone in my friend network that listened to podcast. I didn't know another one person. <laughs> Wow, and and it just—I mean, I, people just yeah. looked at me like I yeah. had seven eyes when I said I'm a podcaster. Um, but now it's especially I find with diverse communities, it's like the thing because we're looking to have these conversations entre nosotros. You know? Yeah, and, and because and also because again, corporatization, consolidation of media has been happening steadily for the last thirty, forty years, uh, and so it's almost impossible on some level to break in. You know, with the so-called mainstream outlets, and now here's this avenue that basically is a little bit of equipment, and you're tied. Uh, and and if you're willing to invest it, uh, and you have something to say, then you know, then you should do it, right? And of course, and of course, if you're talking about sort of our community nationally, uh, you know, there's still there's still an issue in our community with a lot of folks not having a lot of money, right? We still have uh, issues with poverty and work working class families that aren't making ends meet and on and on and uh, but that doesn't mean that there aren't intelligent imaginative people even in that socioeconomic class who have stuff that they want to say online and it goes back to the ownership question because and, and especially in our networks uh, Margo a lot of people are always rusing about the fact like oh how come there aren't more uh, people of color on like the news punditry shows or you know we're always looking for like this this uh, verific co-signing of the mainstream and on right. some level like it's almost forcing us in a good way to do it ourselves. So I think we need to take advantage of this medium to do it ourselves, no, it if is. that makes it sense. Is. You it know, is. so and of course you're seeing, you know, the the best of, uh, of the best of our world and the worst of our world, you know, out there. And mm-hmm. uh, there's some really dark forces out there creating work um, because for the same reasons. Obviously, right? Mar- it's, it's, Marion it's, Williamson it's, fan talking about the dark psychic <laughs> forces <laughs> no, no, of the world. You're showing your cards. You're showing your cards, brother. <laughs> No, no, uh, not, not, I was thinking of her at all. Um, but there's, you know, there's, there's everything now, of course, that is, you know, that you want, uh, and yeah. stuff that maybe you don't want, uh, even on the internet. But what's nice is that it, you know, when you talk about sort of letting the marketplace decide, well, really, if you talk about mainstream media, the marketplace is not deciding anymore, right? right? It's this, it's this consolidated corporate machine, and people are deciding, you know, in, in boardrooms. Right. Uh, but the marketplace, if you will, is deciding who gets on the internet. Margo, jump in this conversation. Talk yeah, to me. I really liked your analogy about um, about podcasting, the podcasting landscape today versus like the independent newspapers like I was thinking about because we were talking about the early days of the Chicano yeah. movement earlier and how in the early days like they were they yeah they had their own little mimeograph machines and they were making oh, yeah. these independent yeah. newspapers and what passed for a newspaper you know in the 17 1800s you know is, is nothing that we would it, it, it was a flyer yeah almost, it was a flyer you know, like a multi plate flyer but it was people, uh, but people were people creating spaces right. to have these conversations right. and right. you're absolutely right cause that the these big you know corporate media um spaces aren't creating a place for these conversations to happen no, because no. they don't feel it's economically feasible. No, because they're serving their, their shareholders and their shareholders want maximum profits and maximum profits come from not taking risks sometimes mm-hmm. or copycatting and doing what the other network did and, and so it becomes this kind of uh, a lot of replication, right? A lot of sort of copycat right. stuff and not sometimes not any room for um, originality and, and look at where we are even in terms of, uh, the, of, the, of the streaming networks, right? They're creating the sort of incredibly creative work because they've entered a domain that didn't exist before, right? right? Netflix didn't exist 10 yeah. years ago. Or now they're being nominated no for it. awards all over right. the place. But they're yeah. also taking chances mm-hmm. and they can take chances because they're in this whole new world where they're not just catering specifically to the stockholders. Inevitably, they probably will. Netflix mm-hmm. you know, will, will have to start to... To, to appeal to stockholders and it'll dumb down things as far as as far as I can tell eventually, but at least that's not where we are right now. And certainly in the podcast world, we're not there. Right, you still have the opportunity to create the space for the conversations that you want to have. And you have, yeah, you have agency and ownership. In yeah, that. and we're doing this, of course, uh, on video and 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 you have the podcast that you distribute, but. You know, most of the podcasts are pure audio, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which speaks incredibly enough to the the power of radio, right? Because it's you know yes. when people have said, said to me who, who are familiar with podcasts, well, what is a podcast? It's it's radio on, on demand. The internet. Yeah. yeah, that's it. It's, no, and the it's thing is, is that with Latinos, on the internet and it's on demand. That's and James it. and Marco, you know this, being media professionals, is that radio is always over indexed with Latinos. So it only yes. makes sense that we would want to engage in this medium. In terms of the marketing work we do around political organizing, to for campaigns and accountability stuff, the the most the we get the strongest reaction 
when we do online ads on live streaming services. Yeah. More so than like, you know, Facebook or and Twitter or anything like that. We're, we over index on these telephones. Exactly. The Latino community. Well, that's we where we're at. If you're not in your phone, it's, you're not there. Right, mm -hmm. right. So, you know. Texting technology. So yeah, it yeah. all goes back to like the sense of community communicating on this phone. Exactly. I remember a few right. years ago, I was at the, um, the Hispanicized conference in Miami. And this was a few years ago. Um, it's like five years ago. And sort of where they talk about trends. They right? talk about trends, trends and media stuff, trends. Really but then yeah. you have like Fox is there, ABC, mm -hmm. yeah. because they want to talk to the Latinos. They want to know what Latinos want. They're trying to and, figure it out. And what are we going to pay for, right? Yeah. And, um, and some of the statistics that they throw out there is about Latinos being the one, the Latinos are mainly demographic that are early adapters of technology. And two, that we are the biggest users of like social media and podcasting and things like that. We even, we even, Outuse really, really, non-Hispanic really whites. Really high yeah. rates. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, there's still a gap in terms of, you know, if you want to buy expensive equipment and have it on your desk at home. Again, because some of the income barriers. But who do we not know? I mean, there, there's these two young guys that just created the documentary, who purposely got themselves arrested and took their cell phones in to the prison to make a movie. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. that tells you so much about the yeah. accessibility of these devices. Right? Yeah. That's right. And, and it's intergenerational. Got, and Part of the reason Sunday. young yeah. Latinos moved to Snapchat and the other platforms is their grandmothers discovered Facebook. <laughs> and <laughs> my Didi's like, yeah. got to get off Facebook. She needs to let it go. But no, we're definitely into it. James, share with people what you're up to. I know you've got Vanguardia, Arizona. And, yeah, I'm here. And uh, you're working on a lot of stuff. Of podcasts, I'm launching uh, something called Vanguardia America. Very exciting. And uh, my background has been in journalism. Uh, a lot of uh, features, straight views, that sort of thing. Uh, political political coverage, that kind of thing. So, uh, so I'm creating what I've described to people as kind of a time magazine for Latinos and English in podcast form. Mm -hmm. right? And so I'll cover... Uh, the arts and business and politics. So I'm here now in, at Unidos, basically launching that and using all the great news that comes out of the Unidos, Unidos Convention. Uh, and there's a lot, a lot of good news today. I mean, a lot of, lot of actual. Yeah, news. let's talk about that because then Monday we have the presidential forum. We're going to have right. four of the presidential candidates right. here: Vice President Biden, Senator Sanders, Klobuchar, and Harris. Right. right. Um, so, so, I'm sorry. So not the, not the. Not the cheap seats. No, not the cheap <laughs> seats at all. Yeah, nine qualified for the debate. The other five, they all, nobody did not want to come. It's just other people were booked. But uh, so, James, at the, what do you want to hear them talk about Monday? Well, as it uh, relates to the Latino well, before, community. Before we talk about that, I, I, you know, I want to mention like what I saw today, mm -hmm. right? Uh, some really solid panels talking about, for instance, healthcare and Latinos. Healthcare is going to be the big issue in the next election, yep. and so it's important to know. Well, racism is going to be the what, underlying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but in terms of know, technically issues, right, yes, important to know where, where, you know, it's the biggest thing for us. That, that. Statistically, and one of the things I heard today was that because of the Trump administration, that enrollments in healthcare in the ACA has started to dip. Yeah, right. That's huge news, right? It's, it's, yeah. it, it reflects a lot of different things. Um, and, and then um, uh, Jen Murguia, the president and CEO of the organization, uh, gave what I thought was uh, the single toughest speech about Trumpism and how it's affecting our community that I've heard come out of the needles in, in NCLR in, you know, in his entire administration. Right? And it was just to the point, hard-hitting, the stuff that needed to be said. Uh, and it was an extremely impressive uh, uh, speech. Uh, so there's that. And then, of course, coming up, there are the, the presidential candidates. So, sorry if you interrupt, no, but no, for no. people who weren't there, what were some of the the main like big points that were in that speech? That, that, that uh -huh. uh, Janet delivered? Yeah. I mean, I think she kind of went through the laundry list of things that all of us sort of talk about, right? But you don't necessarily hear on stage in a major address from the head of the you know national uh, organization that's, that's the leading advocacy group for the community. She's said these things in sort of bits and pieces before in press releases, responding, if you will, uh, to uh, the latest, you know, crazy, chaotic thing that you Trump has relax. done. This sort of wrapped it all together, and it basically talked about the fact that uh, this is a man who in many ways is trying to erase, and that was the way she used, erase our culture, erase our community. And, and, and it really, it, it, it's, it's a quintessential way of describing it. Right? That if you if you if you list all of the various things that have occurred in the last couple of years that have been aimed at Latinos in general, including immigrants, uh, it's an effort, of, if you will, to try to erase our culture. It is exactly right? that. And yeah. and and uh, and her response was basically, you know, we're not going to let that happen. Right? Mm -hmm. you know, and he's scaring the hell of our out of community, but we're not going to run and we're not going to go away and we're not going to let it. And, and and it's it's a good point. And again, I've been saying this quite a bit on the show. Is that 
and I think it's worth repeating, and we have to understand that obviously I, I have special care what's happened in Puerto Rico the last few weeks, but I think the biggest lesson out of that situation is that the Puerto Rican community on the island and the diaspora is to some degree as well has matched the energy to the moment. Yeah. And so uh, I'm so glad that my boss went there today. But I think, you know, just in, you know, broadly speaking, we all need to match the energy of this moment yeah, because it's an existential threat to our democracy as well yeah. as, you know, and this is what I say. And again, you know, it, it's not hyperbolic at this point. We just had another hate crime. Do we want to be South Africa or not? Right. Right, right. And that's I, what I next think, election really is about. I think the, in one, one of the reasons that her speech is so powerful is that it's, it's really channeling the energy that is being felt that's in the community, right. the that's response, right. the, if it's you the resistance, the that's reaction, right? right? It's and, it's not just, and it's not isolated to one specific part of the country. I think if you, it, across the country, every Latino community on some level has responded, right, and, mm-hmm. and responded right. you know, very powerfully. Uh, and uh, and and if, and if they hadn't responded, things would be a lot worse. Believe That's me, right. because Trump is That's the right. kind of guy, like any you know, uh, parking or uh, or playground bully, who if he smells fear, you know, he pushes the envelope and keeps pushing it. Right, and so we've had to push back hard. James, remind people again about your podcast, Vanguardia Arizona. Anything Vanguardia, else you want to share? Well, Vanguardia America is the podcast. I also run a news blog because I live in Arizona called Vanguardia Arizona. Fantastic. Well, I'm telling kind of local regional news. Uh, but what uh, is going to be on Vanguardia America is a newsletter, okay. uh, a weekly newsletter that will be kind of a top-of-the-line news around the country. Uh, and then there will be a podcast that will accompany it. Every Fantastic. Yeah. James, yeah. Where, where can they find you on social media, brother? Keep uh, this going. You can find me on Facebook. Uh, you can find me easy. You know, just look for Vanguardia uh, Arizona or Vanguardia America. You're the only James Garcia online, yeah, so no. it's easy. <laughs> exactly. It's easy. Uh, and, of course, I'm on Twitter at JG uh, underscore Vanguardia. There you go, brother. Uh, and then just Google me and you'll find me. Familia, let's give a round of applause to James Garcia. Good brother right here. <laughs> one of my first guests. And, and actually, he's probably one of the most frequent contributors. You're up there. You're, you, you're up there. You're the... Uh, <laughs> You're, you're, you. Well, who was the guy that used to always go on Letterman? Who was the person who used to go on Letterman all the time? Oh, Jay. Oh, he was. The, remember the guy. The, he had the record. Um, <laughs> anyway, was it Jay it Thomas that used to play something the football like the, at the pizza? Yeah, office? yeah. So you're, you're, you know, you're my right hand, brother. James, appreciate you, man. Hang out for a little bit. We're gonna bring our next guest out here. Before we hear more from our wonderful time at the Polvida Cafe and Barrio Logan community of San Diego, wanted to share a few, few thoughts. Uh, about the Jay Z Colin Kaepernick situation, you know when I when I first heard about the Jay Z Rock Nation deal with the NFL, it, it really sounded fishy, and I think it sounded fishy to a whole lot of people, you know. And apparently, Jay Z and Roger Goodell agreed because there were no cameras, no video, not not you know uh, sort of a casual environment there, uh, not not much transparency. And, you know, there's rumors that a stake of the team is part of this. That wasn't announced, and sort of the parameters of this are sort of still unclear. Sean Carter's statement that we need to quote, we need to go beyond protesting, all ran, also ran hollow for a lot of us. Even his some of his apologists or people who who want to sort of have a positive spin on the situation. You know, you go through moments in your life where, you know, you you think about you know, kind of your initial reaction, then you kind of try to take a step back to try to just stop, justify disagreeing with yourself. But think about what he said. We need to go beyond protesting. The operative word there is we. A movement does go through a process of pushing from the outside for a seat at the table. That is part of the process. Jay-Z is right about that. The problem in this scenario is the leader of this entire discussion, specifically with the NFL, not of the Black Lives Matter movement or the criminal justice movement, but specifically this issue of, of NFL's engagement in these, in these issues as a platform to discuss police brutality and the criminal justice system, specifically how it, how it engages black males, wasn't started by Jay-Z. It wasn't started even really by sort of the larger hip-hop entertainment community. It was, of course, started by former NFL quarterback Colin Kaepernick. Now, many of us, you know, feel queasy, but since it's Jeezy, we're also feeling like we want to give Hove a chance. Maybe there's a side deal with Cap. Maybe he's playing this all along with him. Well, Cap kind of plays the woke capitalist role, too, right? With Nike, he got a settlement. Maybe it is time to turn the page. But, you know, after a few days to reflect, that's not going to happen. None of that's going to happen. And so Jay-Z is now coming to the table without the leader of movement that created the conversation 
uh, from the outside, if you will, in the first place. The bottom line is after three years, Cap is a model citizen. This is not a guy that has any character flaws other than disagreeing with a big chunk of the white male fan base of the NFL on this issue. Um, And, you know, it just becomes more and more apparent that after crappy backup quarterback and crappy backup quarterback get chances and tryouts and deals and deals a year after year, you know, the cap is by far the most polarizing. And I think by a big segment, um, an uncomfortably significant segment of the white male uh, uh, NFL community, uh, sport fan community, the most hated um, figure in sports. Um, you know, be an Eagle fan the last few weeks as we've had a backup quarterback and a third string quarterback go down an injury with a season where we can win this whole thing and a quarter, a starting quarterback who I love and who's a good guy, Carson Wentz, um, and who gave co-work uh, teammates on his team space to engage in this issue to his credit. That was a tough balance for him, but he was very good at it. You know, it was kind of brittle. And the best we can come up with, Josh McCown, a 40-year-old guy who told us a few weeks ago he didn't want to play anymore and retired. So we would rather bring him off the off the out of the cobwebs um, than even give Colin a tryout. That's all I'm asking for. Maybe he is done, but we don't know. That's the problem. So JD, Jay Z, I think at the end he does deserve a little time, a little space to explain himself. I have a lot of questions. I think many of us do, and indeed to see how this plays out. Maybe he's going to pull some rabbits out of his hat. But usually, I find like you got to trust your gut, and I think our gut tells all of us that there's just something wrong with how this scenario has played out. And we need to find to get the leader of this movement and the one who many fear because of his fearlessness, Colin Kaepernick, in some way back at the table in the NFL and in the conversation uh, uh, in, an, in a leadership role or a similar platform to have a leadership role to continue to move this conversation about policing and the criminal justice system in this country. Let's get back to the rest of our show in San Diego. We got to break out this gender balance. There's way too many guys, so we're gonna bring our dear, our new friend up here. Let's give her a round of applause. Hey! Woo! You know, you, you you didn't think you were gonna come to the party and not have to talk. Come on now. Ma'am, introduce yourself to the Founder Translation not family. Not a problem. Uh, Naomi Shelton, Director of Community Engagement for the Kip Foundation. Fantastic. Oh, Say hello to Na- Naomi. So, Naomi. Uh, politely called us out this morning because she was like, we need to talk more about education. So I said, we come on a podcast and rap about it. So Naomi, um, first of all, just your uh, impressions about your time here in San Diego so far, oh, the conference, yes. Chicano park, right. this is a memorable moment for sure. Um, so I do a, quite a bit of traveling and this is now my third time in San Diego, but the first time actually leaving conferences. And I will definitely say that the city is beautiful. I uh, thoroughly appreciate culture and community and all those things that are universal. Well, you're, 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 right? you're, you're I mean, we're in it. We're, we we're in a, sh- uh, and I am a bubble bath here of culture here. Beyond elated to, yeah, like, to be here stuff. and to, to see and hear and, you know, the previous guests to hear about the story of uh, the two places that they own the cafe and the, the restaurant yeah. uh, i mean this is real you know right here. there's something that you know when you like own something that is you know a pr- product of your mother's recipes and what that has done for you know you in terms of like feeding you every day but being able to share that with other people and what that sure. means that's universal sure. i also work in engagement that's my day okay. job too okay. um so so what is um where where are you here from just geographically Geographically, Washington, D.C., which I'm sure you can understand has some great cultural uh, anchors as well. Yeah. And something I really appreciate and love about just what it means to, to hold, um, to be a, a stronghold in the community. Um, I live not too far from Anacostia, which I'm sure has mm-hmm. its own similarities to this community mm-hmm. here. Um, so being a, uh, a native of uh, Mississippi, but having grown up in D.C., being able to see how things are, you know, different in different places, but universal and all the same. So being so local to the capital, like, mm-hmm. what is the climate like there? Because I've only, I've only dipped in and out, like, a little bit since the, since the big march, right. the day after. Right, right. Um, so I would say I've been there since I was five. Um, so I've seen a great ah. um, um, shift. Uh, my mother worked on the Hill. My mother worked on Capitol Hill for a senator from the state of Mississippi. 
Um, so I've seen a lot of this stuff, you know, front row. And I would say the climate has shifted in terms of like people's relationships. So you can tell that the native Washingtonians are really trying to draw a line of like, that is, that's the Washington they talk about on the, on the news, but we're Washingtonians and DC is a culture and climate of itself. And so we want to make sure we're creating a delineation of that is them, we are us and we've been here. Um, and you know, I, it's it's interesting to like walk out into what you consider your backyard and see you know people wearing clothing, etc., and ex accessories that are really supposed to be a a, um, a poster of, of a line of delineation between us and them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we talked before uh, uh, earlier. We talked about gentrification, housing, mm -hmm. how this has been establishing this cultural hub and this historical center has been a way to sort of keep, hold on to this neighborhood. Yeah. Margot began our show yeah. by talking about how initially it was taken away yeah. and how they were fought to give it back. Let's talk about education for a second, my friend. Because yeah. one of the things I get frustrated by, I talk about it a lot on the show, we talked about it in our post-debate shows uh, these last few months, is that nationally we ain't talking nearly enough about education right. across mm -hmm. the board. Right. And one of the things that I try to input on this show is not only bring on experts like yourself, but talk about the fact that this is a civil rights issue that we're not talking about with that lens. Right. Because if you're talking about, you know, uh, education disparities in terms of uh, resources and all the other issues that sort of ripple from that, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, and it's and, and that's what's it hurts me so much. Right. And I'm, I really believe that because because there is such a level of racism to it, but also. Even beyond the diversity piece, such a waste of time right. because we're I mean, we're talking we're we're, we're arguing how rough to treat refugees when we see you talk about how do we why don't we teach every child how to code right. you know like we're you know we're 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 playing you know we should be playing chess or we're playing uh, we're you know playing mortal combat right. you know as four-year-olds so talk right. to us about about why it's important to get this conversation going and what would education should we be talking about well i think it's important to you know for people to know that all the issues that we talk about um you know when it comes to economic development housing health, um, all of those things are connected and related to education. Um, the opportunity to be, uh, be able to go beyond the 12th grade, that means whether it is college or career that you're seeking, that you have to have a, an excellent foundation to be able to do that. And if that is what America is supposed to be built on, a land of opportunity, we have to provide that opportunity to everyone. And the idea of like, we're, you know, allocating funds to one school versus the other and within, you know, a five mile radius and the money is really and truly only allocated based on tax revenue and how the tax base of that of that neighborhood. That's something that we're saying that our society should be segmented. It's very clear. You you want to know someone's priorities, you look at their budget, you look at their budget. That's right. Like, right. And so the idea that we're fighting about we're fighting about uh, traditional schools versus traditional um, um, uh, charter schools. Like they're public schools. There are they're the children of taxpaying public who are going to sending their children to those schools. Let's just be very clear that we don't need to talk about whether or not they they need to be here. They're here because families want to have the option and choice to send their children to different schools. I want to get to that. Yep. Let's get to that. But before yep. I do, want to touch on something that it's ironic mm -hmm. to your point mm -hmm. a moment ago. It's ironic that the biggest educational issue so far, mm -hmm. good Senator Bennett actually brought it up the other day. Give him a little props for that. Um, that's been discussed in the presidential primary debates was actually about busing, right. if you think about it, right? Mm -hmm. right? And how, if we really look at it, how that is that speaks to this point you just talked about, that, that education, housing, all this is wrapped up in this, in this social engineering of segregation right. mm -hmm. that we still have and our education right. system still has. But to get to the point you just brought up, it's very interesting when you talk about charter schools. I'll just talk about in the Latino community, Margo, mm -hmm. if you have any thoughts on it. Because talking about sort of from a community level, our folks are like, you know, we almost don't care. Right. You know, charter, public, magnet, parochial. Right. Just I just, if I can, if I can that's find right. a, a school yeah. that's reasonably near my house. Right. That's a half notch better than the, the school down the block. Right. Then I'm, go. I'm good. I'm in. And right. we've been talking about, and I'll say the progressive movement mm. has been talking about this for decades. And the community's response is, I don't got decades. Right. My kid's in school right now. Right. And so, and I know that's a complicated thing, right? right. Because we're talking about, that's, it's simple said, but it's, but it, and it, but it also is a, a per case basis in the same way we have 
GOAT charter schools that are mm-hmm. that that are grown from the community. We have many that are represented here at this conference. We also have mm-hmm. the corporate piece and yep. people making money off our folks and 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 our cert, current education secretary is the poster child for it. Right. So one of the things Talk I'll, to me. I'll point to, so See, I we're going to get real here, girl. Yeah, we this ain't going to be this ain't, you know, with all due no, respect, this ain't NPR. Yeah, right. This is this is the real deal. Let's talk about it. So I'm not a parent. But I also was a product of, for um, I'd say maybe four years, uh, D.C. public charter, public schools, not charter, public schools. We moved out to Prince George's County, which is one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest, African-American um, bases of uh, wealth yeah. in, um, in the, I'd say, the country, um, yeah. which is adjacent to Washington, D.C. It's in the state of Maryland. Um, we moved back into D.C. and I just know that over time, as I went along in my career, I could see this decline in what students were were equipped with when they went out into the workforce. And so, as you think about that, that happens, you know, in the work that I did prior to joining KIPP, I was with United Negro College Fund, UNCF, which is a scholarship organization um, that supports 37 private HBCUs. But uh, the work that I did is very similar to the work I do now with KIPP, and it's focused on how do we talk about and amplify the issues around education, not only for African American students, but students that are getting an inequitable uh, form of education. So it wasn't until people realized that black and brown people were opting out of the traditional public system that people started talking about segregation, right? Mm. It wasn't Amen. until mm. parents realized <laughs> that, hey, Oh, wait, so now the narrative is around segregation? You didn't have a problem with segregation when those when the kids were in schools that were failing them. You didn't have a problem with it then. Exactly so why right. is it that now it's a problem that all these schools are black? Our proximity to whiteness does not improve our outcomes, right? Mm-hmm. That's like, that's yeah. like random data that people are trying to pull together to say and create a case for why we should. No, we, we can have It helps our kids good schools. Right. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, just and what so we should be talking like we should be talking not about like oh who are they sitting next to but who are the people in front of them that are teaching them and giving them what they need to have. Yes. And if they're not doing a good job of that, then let's talk about that. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about teacher preparation. Let's have a conversation about those things but mm-hmm. people want to throw us off from those conversations and focus on things that really don't matter. That is an right? amazing point. And so like the idea of if parents want their kids to go across because we know with magnet programs and all kinds of other things, people were getting on buses, but now that we have concentrated um, sectors of communities that are saying we're going to do for this for us, mm-hmm. by us, with us, or people that have done it for us and we just want to collectively be in that space, then you want to break it up? No, that's that's intentional. And we have to really look at why people want to bring up and create all these, uh, you know, to shake up why people are saying they want to be in these spaces together. But like, until, like, were they really worried about segregation when they when white flight was a thing? Hmm. Are we talking about segregation when we look at students? A lot of snapping Iowa? going on I here, know, Margo. I Jump know. in this conversation, Margo. My language. My mom, Talk to us. My mom, like I said earlier, was a, was a public school teacher and an education activist right here in Barrio Logan and also in an, an even more uh, economically challenged uh, mm-hmm. barrios in San Diego. And my whole childhood was filled with walkouts and strikes, and she was always fighting and fighting and fighting for these kids. Mm-hmm. And it was so often falling on deaf ears Mm -hmm. right now my own two children are in charter schools i put them in charter schools here in barrio logan because i wanted them to be here in in this community interacting with this community and yes my daughter's school teaches them coding and my son's school teaches them social justice Mm -hmm. but the Mm -hmm. the i live in a mostly white neighborhood and so if i put them in the neighborhood schools um they did not feel supported supported exactly and so, yes, ex- this is exactly what we're seeing here, right. that the charter schools, now that the minority people are putting their children in the charter schools, now we're talking about buses can you, again. Can you give me a second about, can you put in perspective the kind of harm our Secretary of Education is doing to our folks? Well, uh, so I remember the day after the election, waking up and thinking to myself, the work that we've done to really unravel some of the negative and, and, and really untrue narrative and rhetoric around charter schools, we're going to have to start from scratch. So there are people in the, in the, um, in the charter landscape who are bad actors, who are doing things that they should not be doing, who are doing this for their own profit. Uh, but I think it's important for us to really say and think about what does it mean to have someone who is a poster child for something but also know that there are small, independently run, there are small uh, 
really truly focused on supporting communities that we have to disassociate the the large wealthy all of the things that are not helpful um, and people that are just aren't doing it for the for the right to true intentionality but who are we thinking about supporting as we're moving forward in this work That's right. we, we have people that are out here day in and day out black and brown people that have started charters and those should be the po those should be the people that we see talking about hearing about and, and really focusing on the work that's happening in the charter space let people know where they can find you keep in touch with you engage in this conversation my sure friend. so for me directly naomi shelton dc that's my twitter handle okay um for kip kip at kip um and i think i'm just gonna plug uncf too because i think absolutely we all know that we are a mind's a terrible thing to waste but a wonderful yeah. thing to invest in exactly that's right. so um I thank you for the time and opportunity. We're going to keep talking. Yeah. Education, you know, I mean, we, we don't take care of our kids. There's not yeah, much yeah. else to talk about. I mean, you, it, there's an African proverb, you know, if you want to know about a, a, a society, like, how are the children? And Amen. we know that the children in this country are not being served well. Let me tell you, when we do these shows, the right. three biggest things that resonate, well, the biggest theme that resonates is whether it's identity, education, health, politics, is when we talk about how Latinos and African Americans are going to work together. That's right. And that's the strongest across the board, the strongest Listen, reaction I get. Because people are really craving that conversation. Um, and it's, uh, it's overdue. Yes. I mean, one of the reasons I'm, I'm here is, well, my, my title, I have to engage communities. That means all communities. Absolutely. Right? But I think that there is an intentional divide that's, what, that's been created for that's us right. to not really engage, to that's not right. think about how to we can have collective power. As people know, like us being the global uh, majority, Folks will be upset. It's amazing. When we work together, great things happen, don't they? Let's give Naomi a round of applause for being on the show. And we're going to, to wrap this up, we're going to bring back our dear friend, the Cuban Lion. Here he comes. And the Cuban Lion. Let's give it up for the Cuban Lion. My man came all the way from L.A. for today. And uh, you know what? An ode to our sister sitting here who's who's, who's just a participant. We're going to have her on the show another time. Let's talk about our love for the state of North Carolina and college basketball, brother. Can we do that, dear? <laughs> so, Neesom, just riff on, 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 on what North Carolina hoops means to you, brother. Well, I know most people are going to talk about the Tar Heels and the Blue Devils. Yeah. So, most people are. But I'm going to talk think, about dear? the Wolf Pack. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. My favorite college We're not going basketball. East Carolina Pirates, dog. Let's no, no, stick no, to no, the no, triangle. No, no. <laughs> ECU. So we can throw in the Pirates too. Okay, but That's when, you, when, you, when you talk about iconic, yes, March Madness tournament teams, oh. how can you not talk about Jim Valvano's North Carolina, Lorenzo State, Charles, Lorenzo Charles, Wittenberg, Wittenberg um, the guy that uh, throw Bailey. Thurl Bailey he had a good call. Right. career. Thurl. Yeah, man, played for the Utah Jazz for quite a. Let me let time. me tell you my North Carolina. So when I was a child in Philadelphia, I mean, I grew up in baseball. My we literally had a team, so baseball was number two. My number two was college basketball. And when you're a little kid growing up in North Philly, and all you, it's just television. There's three channels. And my dad, my mom wrote my my, my dad was a, a, a DJ on the weekend, so he was always at a bar gigging like this. But surprise, how I ended up right. And so my babysitter on the weekends was sports. So in the winter, I watched college basketball. And I thought North Carolina was the, must have been the most wonderful place in the world. They have all these basketball players. They have cool uniforms. Then I had a relative move to North Carolina. So I would go to North Carolina for Christmases, Thanksgivings. And the thing that always struck me when I went around is even white kids know how to play basketball here. I mean, it was just a wonderful <laughs> place. I mean, they just taught a ball. So. Basketball heaven. But it's just amazing, Nisa, because we have. And we're going to get, speaking of basketball, we're going to get to your L.A. Uh, team in a second. But that it is, America is such a great place because I think about like Indiana and Kansas, and you have these hotbeds, Texas high school football, right? You have these hotbeds. Look at this, man. Look. One day I want to follow a team throughout Texas. Man. Yeah, you know what I love about this part of the world, Margo? I don't know if you know this, is that your Chula Vista Little League is like a, a power. Yeah. And they're always on TV, and there's a bunch of little Latino Filipinos yes, you know, just killing it. You know, so it just needs some tell people what, what. I know that's a big reason why you love sports, brother. So, you know, when you went back then, you know, you had a couple of choices. Like I always tell people, they go, how come you like hockey? You know, there's no hockey. You didn't play hockey. There wasn't hockey available to you in Boyle Heights. Nice and cool in the arena. But you know what? 
they used to give us free tickets <laughs> because nobody would go to the LA Kings games back then. <laughs> this was pre Wayne Gretzky. So we'd go, and, and you know what I realized from that time too? They used to give everybody a peanut butter and jelly sandwich yeah, when we're you used to go way to the game. Back here, dog. Yeah, because no one had peanut allergies back then. <laughs> For some reason. We, right? <laughs> See, I don't remember that happening to any of my friends. I just remember I had my peanut butter and jelly sandwich, oh my God. and we're going to go see Marcel Dion and the Kings, and it was awesome. I remember I remember when the concept of everyone buckling their, it was, like, funny. Like, uh uh-huh. Wearing your seatbelts? Oh, my God. Yeah. That was just, like, 87. This wasn't, like, AJ history. So we're driving to Crenshaw High School. I'm coaching my second year. I'm Damn, we're going deep old. into L.A. here, my 20 friends. 20 years old. I got a car full of, like, 15 kids in the back of my truck. <laughs> Because we had only one other coach that drove, right? And no parents. So we're on the 110 freeway, and one of the kids goes, Coach, pull over. Pull over. I go, what happened? He goes, pull over. He goes, I got a cramp. And all the kids are getting off the car so he can stretch out his leg. (laughs) And he stretches out his leg, and we put the 15 kids back in the car, and we go play our football game. Neeson, I got two more for you. (laughs) Lakers, Clippers. L.A. seems to be the, the, the epicenter of the NBA it, again. I know we got some hoop fans in the building. It, 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 what, it will, what will this season – let me ask you a question. What will this season mean to L, the L.A. sports fans with these two powerhouses battling it out in Staples Center So with these bigger-than-life personalities? So on paper right now, yes, it looks awesome, right? Yes, it does. Because you got A.D. and LeBron on one side – and you got Kawhi and Paul George on the other side. Yeah, the best player in the NBA. So, so we've never had this. And one of the things that I brought up was LeBron's playing for his legacy a little bit. Not, he's not playing for uh, Do we? Is LeBron one of the greatest players ever? Yes. He cemented that already. Absolutely. But is he one of the top three? If Kawhi goes in now and steals L.A. from him. What does that mean to his legacy? I think it means he's... Eight, seven, Ooh, I don't know. and Kawhi all of a sudden. You don't think he surpassed Kobe regardless? I don't think so. But Ooh, then again, oh, oh. but then again, <laughs> I'm a homer. Yes, you are. All right, but okay, let's. Uh-huh. I will say this. Yes. Right now, the Clippers scare the living hell out of me because that was a team that made the playoffs without those two guys. I still, I, I love my Lakers. I think they're going to do great, but. The Clippers scare the well, hell Let's see out if of Anthony Davis shows some leadership because my, my issue with you, and we'll, we'll see how it goes. But my question to Anthony Davis is, when LeBron, that older guy that's not going to play every game, when he's not playing, you basically have a worse roster than the Pelicans had last year. So he needs to step it up quickly. He needs some, are your Dodgers finally going to get over the hump? We're just going to do around the horn here on L.A. Sports. Look, here. man, it's, it's almost gotten to the point where now going to the World Series back-to-back, it's championship or bust. Exactly. And, and, now, and, and you're talking now we are – 31 years removed from our championship. Dude, I weighed like eight, yes. I weighed about a buck sixty yeah. and I had a full set of hair back then. <laughs> that was a long time ago. A few brother. years back. And by though. the way, yes. it's pronounced Doyers. 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 Yes, Doyers. Doyers. You know Nisa, I'm 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 pouring a little bit out here. <laughs> okay. Well I appreciate it. And I'm that. pouring a few because we gotta give some love to the San Diego sports scene. Oh, I know. And yet again, L.A. has stolen one of the seminal franchises from our beloved San Diego sports fans. How does it feel, Nisam, as someone that has been as an L.A. resident, a Charger fan for quite some time? So I keep it real. So I to get it. take this from I can feel the tension between you, Margo, right now. So I, I get it from the L.A. Ram fans. Yes. As well you we should. didn't want the Chargers here. We don't want them here. You want to be a Charger fan? Go ahead and be one. I was a Charger fan for 20-some-odd years. Why? Because my Raiders and my Rams left. When the Rams went to Anaheim, that was it. See, Anaheim's not L.A. Yep, it's not. No. They put something in the water down there. (laughs) It's a lot of hockey rivalries there. (laughs) So I became a Raider fan. When the Raiders left, I had to find a team that geographically I could go watch all the time. Chargers made great sense. So when they became, when they came to L.A., I was, like, all for it. But you know who jumped on, uh, all over me, too? Were the San Diego fans. Yeah. You know? They're never they going to be, be supported. Diego. No one's going to go. You took hey, the Clippers. The you new take stadium, the Chargers. They've sold, I believe, 
right around sixty something percent of their season ticket uh, tickets it's not, for the new stadium. That's no bueno. Not right yeah. now, but you're still no bueno. you're still talking about a year away. Yeah. So it's, so we'll see, man. I got you, Margo. Um, at least you have the Padres. San Diego we State, the Aztecs. The and, this, and the Aztecs, I work on A lot on of the cool camp- gear. Yes. I still see Charger gear. I still see. I work on the campus of San Diego State. So oh, I, I am surrounded beautiful by. Campus. It is a beautiful campus. I Kawhi Leonard. Did he go to San Diego State? Yes. Yeah. Kawhi Leonard, yeah. yeah. San Diego So, game. yes, the Aztecs are still still a big draw. Margo, we're going to wrap this up. Remind people. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your book you yes, have here and anything else you want to share about your podcast. My book just came out last month. It's called Growing Up in La Colonia. Um, it is about the barrio of La Colonia in Oxnard, which is about 200 miles north of here. It's a farming community. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about how Cesar Chavez was from Arizona when his family lost everything. The first place they went was La Colonia in Oxnard. And his experience as a young farm worker there was so traumatic that it changed the trajectory of his life and when he began his activism career the very first place he went back to was La Colonia and he had a, a close tie with those people and their struggle there and so it's about um, it's about this barrio that uh, both my parents are from and the racism the segregation that they dealt with but also the just like we have here the richness of the culture and the the strength of the community that got them through all of that. And I wrote the book because I went to Oxnard and I learned that Cesar Chavez basically were, that he was my back, my grandparents' backyard neighbor. Wow. I never knew that this. Awesome. They're That's long amazing. gone. I couldn't ask them about it now. And when I went to find history about it, all of the history books I found about the area did not include Latinos, which are three quarter percent of the population there. Wow. And so I wrote a letter to one of the publishers who published those books complaining, and I got a book deal. That's awesome. <laughs> and so the book, again, it's called Growing Up in La Colonia. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on Barnes & Noble. Um, it's from Arcadia Press. So. Mar- Margo, we're definitely have to have you back on the show just to take a deeper dive. But it's so important that we document our history. This is great. Nisa, you have a question? I, I, you know, always connecting things to sports. The minute yeah. I saw Oxnard, La Colonia, was, you know, the Garcia brothers. Absolutely. Robert and Mikey and what he's done uh, with, with that boxing stable over there. You start talking about Robert Garcia now. He's one of the top three trainers in the Absolutely. sport. Fernando no Vargas, an Oxnard guy. About a lot it. of tra- a lot no of history. No doubt about it. He's the old stand- Spice guy from Oxnard. Really? The wide receiver, yeah, from Arizona State. Yeah, yeah. Wow. He was Jake the Snake's wide receiver okay. at Arizona State. Yeah. Oxnard, uh, the city of Oxnard, just recently they we were talking about erasing, <laughs> erasing information. They. Uh, we were really badly mismanaged and they had a nine million dollar deficit and their first response was to close the library in la colonia close the library in the barrio that was the first thing they wanted to do to save money and all kinds of people came out and fernando vargas came from las vegas personally oh, nice with his with his crew and his belts yes showed up at the city council Remember when you had those. to to uh speak for the for the that's, library and, and and they saved it that is for that is you know, really small quick tidbit, yeah. was it what five years ago at the Unidos conference. We hung out with Fernando. Fernando Vargas was there, and he took a picture with my mom. And he was Aww. fantastic. And that was really He was cool. very generous to us. We went over to him and said, ah, thank you, Fernando. Anyway, yeah. you know, I just want to publicly thank Margo Borras. This didn't happen without Margo. Absolutely. Margo reached thank out you. and said, if you're going to be in San Diego, let's let's do it right. And um, I want to thank uh, you guys, are, you know, all of our friends that are with us here today um, for coming out, stepping away from the Unidos conference for a few moments to join the community, support Por Vida. Um, but uh, most importantly, again, thank you so much, Margo. You all will never know all the stuff that Margo did to make this happen. Pick up chairs, you know, find a location, you know. No, absolutely. So, uh, I'm sorry? She installed the Astro Turf. Yes, yes. We're going to get seven innings in um, after this. But again, Margo Borjas, thank you so much. We're going to continue to support all your projects. And thank you so much to the Fountain Translation community and, and the Chicano Park community of San Diego. Thank you.